I doing this workshop? In an experimental way. So I have got, I think I've got six or seven. Okay. Um, if we get into groups of four, could you? So we're going to break up these nice lines of chairs. If you can group yourselves into groups of four. That would be great. That's what I might do. All right. Self organizing. We're doing five. We're doing five, I guess. We're doing five. Let's break some of the rules already. Yeah. Learn the rules. All right. If you are not in a group, put your hand up. What's up? All right. All right. Is there a large group? Is there a group of large, more than four? Yes, we have five. We're five. Yeah. We're five. Okay, I have to get the batch and always get the hardest part. Let's take that. Okay. Um, right, here we go. Okay, if you um, don't do this just for a sec. So most of you have got news reports about um, the big story of the day, Jihadi John, uh, and these are cuttings from the last couple of days. So um, for the people who've got news reports, if you, could, if you just open up the packet and look at it, if you've got a news report, stick your hand up. If you've got something that isn't a news report as such, um, okay, news, okay. Your opinion. Your opinion. Okay, over there, are you news or something else? Good news. Okay, what, what about you folks? Yeah. It says news, but uh, it may have to make up their mind. Okay, so for the folk who've got news stories, um, there's one particular little thing that I'd like you to check out, which is um, what views are reported from the families of victims of the man who's just been exposed. Okay? What views are reported from families of victims? So you can go right ahead. Apart from here, are there any opinion votes? Okay. Okay.
Okay, you have a couple more minutes. about terror, there was one in the Times, Heart of Darkness. So I didn't give them those, um, but we wouldn't have added anything to the task. So what I was, the question was, now, something that is part of the national conversation about radicalization and so on is that a role is played by Western foreign policy in causing it, accelerating it, or whatever. So that's part of the conversation about this kind of stuff. So in these opinion pieces, how was that, was it, did it come up at all? If it did, then in what way? So if you just tell us where these opinion pieces are from. This one is Jonathan Friedman from The Guardian. Yeah. And he mentioned, he does bring okay, I'll just find out where they're from, Sorry, just to let everyone know. So this is also from The Guardian. Guardian, Guardian. Guardian three Guardians. Telegraph. One Telegraph. So I think that's all the opinion pieces apart from the editorials that have happened in the last couple of days. So, did anyone find any mention of the foreign policy argument? Yes. Okay. He, he says that, it, that uh, people were saying that he was affected by the foreign policy, but then he kind of says, well, that's not true, actually. Some, he spoke to someone who said that that didn't affect him. Okay. So if you could hold up the article to everyone and point to the bit where, so we can see where the foreign policy is. Okay, I'm not sure everyone can see. Up here. Up there. Okay, so that's that's about halfway through now. Okay, all right. Were there any other mentions of? Just the, in five. Okay, let's go. It just says that foreign policy grievances. Do you want to turn around and oh, talk yes. to the group? Oh, yeah. yeah. This is opinion in the Guardian. Who's it written by? Oh, yes, by Aslan. I think it was one of our speakers. Maybe not. Majid Aslan. That's liberal. Yeah. Now, Aslan is not one of our speakers. So it was inferred in with, um, I've just lost it now, foreign policy grievances, and then it refers to it later. Um, something, whether by law or war. Do you want to read out the relevant sentence so everyone can hear it? Similarly, it is disingenuous for many Muslims and others to solely criticise foreign policy grievances, grievances without, without also openly debunking Islamist ideology in its peaceful or violent manifestations. So he only kind of um, briefly alludes to that. I'm just going to check. Is there anyone who didn't hear that sentence who'd like to hear it again? Yeah, there, there, there were some people at the back. So, uh, it would be great if someone turned up and addressed the folks at the back. That would be really good. Sorry. Um, <laughs> 
Similarly, it is disingenuous for many Muslims and others to solely criticize foreign foreign policy acquaintances without also openly debunking Islamist ideology in its peaceful or violent manifestations. So if you could hold up the whole article and yeah. point to where that sentence occurs in the well, article. Of that column, he basically mentions it here. So where my fun is, place. An ultimate paragraph. Okay. Any reflections on the placing, first of all, about those two things, the where, where it crops up? It's not mentioned before that point in either article. Yeah. Any thoughts about placing? Oh, I think it's crucial. I mean, what is said at the beginning in any writing holds the, the writer's reader's attention. So by the end, you know, they've gone off, they've missed it. Okay, you wanted to make a point? Well, placing it at the end gives you a high chance that they won't even get there because it's inverted pyramid, they don't have to. It gives them the information. A good chance the reader won't get to that point. Are there any journalists in the house who... You are a journalist. Okay, all right, cool. Okay, um, what do sub-editors do <laughs> to stories when they don't fit? They <laughs> crop the last paragraph, and they crop the, the one before and the one before the fifteen. Okay, so w information at the end, it's not just that the reader might not get there, that's the most likely bit to get lost when a sub-editor is trying to squeeze to space. Okay, all right. So that's placement. Um, now, there's also something about kind of like how you handle that argument. So in the first case, um, what would you say about how kind of like how the, the foreign policy argument is, is dealt with? Well, he, he, in, this, in this article, he sort of, you know, he, he just says it doesn't hold, so it doesn't hold up. He, the, the, the foreign, the foreign, what the West was doing in the Middle East makes no difference. He was radicalized anyway. Okay, right. Now in the second sentence, in the second thing, piece, uh, I think everyone heard that the first third of the sentence mentions the foreign policy argument and then the rest of it is going and saying you've got to do all this other stuff as well. And so uh, it's not just about placement, there is also something <coughs> about um, tone and about how you handle it. And on this particular case, there's a lot of information that we have about um, the police's own views on radicalization, intelligence services, foreign office views about radicalization. I'm not now saying that it's, it's true that foreign policy causes radicalization. I'm making a point about how the evidence behind that argument is being treated in these stories, where the evidence doesn't occur, and there's a way that the, the, the argument is being handled um, which makes it likely that People aren't going to notice it so much. Okay, so the other question for most groups was about the views of the families of victims of the man who's just been exposed. Did anyone find any reports about that? I, I see nodding over here. You were the, which paper were you with? The Guardian. The Guardian. Okay. Do you want? If it's lengthy, do you want to summarise? If it's brief, do you want to read it out? Um, it's quite brief, it's the last paragraph, um, and it says, uh, Dragana Haynes, widow of aid worker Alan Haynes, killed by Amwazi, said yesterday, hopefully he will be caught alive. That's the only moral satisfaction for the families of all the people he murdered, because he gets killed in action. If he gets killed in action, that will be an honourable death for him. That's so the end. So that's the last paragraph. Is there any reference to it in the headline, or before then? Well, that, Don't think no. so. Okay, no. alright. Anyone else find any families quoted? Two hands at the back, let's go... With the first hand first, yep. Okay. Which paper is this? It's the Times. Okay. There's these sections here. Okay, so do you want to. Do you want to. Okay, so what's the headline of that piece? He wants to see a bullet in his head. Okay. And it's the voice of one of the families, his daughter, of the murdered aid worker. Okay, uh, I noticed you've highlighted two sections. That's two sections of uh, the, 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 the voice of a. Uh, and the second, the, uh, the daughter of murdered British aid worker said only a bullet in between the eyes but bring peace to her family. Yeah. And at the bottom here it says the mother of Foley, a freelance journalist, uh, says she forgives her son's killer. It saddens me. She told the Times. Yeah. And what's the placement of that? Well, that's right at the bottom of that one. 
The last paragraph. Yeah. Okay, all right. So someone else found. And what paper is that? It's the Times as well. Is it the same day? 27. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So this is inside page, that's front page. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the front page. Um, then there's all, yeah, then there's basically all this about um, this background. And then when we get to page four, we have this sort of small bit here, um, which is pretty much half of it is practically quotes from victims, friends, and families. Um, that ties this name and killer could add to peril. I'm not entirely sure who has got page five where it continues. But, um, uh, and peril. Uh, page five. Yeah, uh, uh, for British, British, British hostage. And what are the views expressed by the victims, families? Um, well, I can read a few examples. Uh, we want to sit in a courtroom, watch him sentenced, and see him sent to a super max prison where he will spend the rest of his life in isolation. He needs to be annihilated. Um, yeah. I feel physically sick thinking he has a name. They're all pretty wild. Is that a representative sample of the views then? That in your in your article? That you've read? Pretty much. There aren't views more violent or less violent than that in that. There's also someone saying that um, she did not blame the security services for paying to promote this to Syria. They're doing the best they can. Um, yeah. Okay, did anyone else find any quotes from victims? Yeah, victim family, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had, um, Which paper are you? Guardian. Front page. Okay. And then this is a, oh, the, the next office after that, I guess. Yep. Um, yeah. So we have found some stuff. Um, here. Do you want to point? Yeah. Do you yeah, want to point so, out? Do we know where to hold it? Right there. Uh huh. So, is there any mention in the headline or before that in the article? No, nothing. Okay. Like that. Right. So then here, the first time that the family stuff comes in. It's all quite kind of violent stuff, I guess. So it's a thing about the bullet between his eyes, um, somebody else saying he wants to sit in a courtroom watching sentence and seeing sentence to Supermax prison when he will spend the rest of his life in isolation. Um, and then, at the end of this kind of double spread on the inside, the page, which is page five, uh -huh. there's a kind of blue highlighted box here, which is a profile of the victim's family, or the victim's and there's three bits about um, comments from the family, and they're all quite passive, and they're all much more positive. Do you want to read them? So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uh, the 17 year old daughter, Lucy Ivan Henning, said, We shared our bags with the children of Syria and our dad did. Um, James Foley's father said, We miss his courage and his love and his determination, his laugh and his smile. And David Haynes' brother spoke of his joy and anticipation. Okay, though. So the quote that got a front page headline was. We want to see a bullet in his head. Okay. Um, was that representative of all of the families of, of the victims? Uh, no, it was too quite. I mean, even in that article, it's not. It, it's yeah. not like the universal view. But um, has anyone else found anyone else quoted? expressing the same bullet in the head view, apart from the daughter. Okay, so there's a range of views. That's the one that gets the headline. Uh, and the, at the end of it, it quotes a woman called? Uh, uh, the mother of Foley, Diane Foley. Diane Foley. Did anyone else find a quote from Diane Foley about forgiveness? All right, so Diane Foley gets the last para of a story which basically contradicts the headline, as you know, representing the views of the families, um, she doesn't get mentioned again in the in the article, which is about the views of the families of victims on the inside pages. The other papers didn't pick it up, and that was yesterday's paper. So today's paper, they had the you know whatever papers somehow didn't manage to get that quote yesterday, they had a chance to get it for today. No one else decided to run that. 
Um, all of the milder stuff is basically downgraded in terms of placement and so on. So uh, this is just like a tiny part now of how the mainstream media works. Now, if someone was to say that Diane Foley's views were censored from, from the newspapers, someone could say, no, they were printed. Okay? But it was printed once in one paper, which had several articles on this, you know, it had two articles on this topic. But, you know, it was printed once, and it basically didn't appear anywhere else. So it was effectively censored. Now, there was no one in Whitehall telling all the papers, don't quote Diane Foley, because forgiveness is you know, not the right direction for where we want to go. Um, so, I'm here to say a little bit about Chomsky's model of uh, the mass media. And so this is, a, this is a tiny example of what Chomsky points to as mechanisms of how you can have a free media which is not state controlled, where there isn't some stasi person in the newsroom looking over your shoulder, there's no one in the Ministry of Truth sending you a directive about quoting or not quoting Diane Foley, um, where it's a guided free market in ideas. But you get these patterns um, which aren't to do with the peculiarities of the times. You know, it, we're, we're seeing something with the other papers as well. Um, so I drew this, yeah, I usually give this workshop in a cat in a in a field, in a in a in a tent. So this is this is what I drew to, to illustrate some aspects of uh, how the media manages to report stuff but effectively distort what the information you get. So uh, part of it is about placement putting things at the end which aren't flagged up in the headline or earlier on. Uh, part of it is about the emotional temperature with which it's presented. Um, and part of it is about frequency, about how often that piece of information gets repeated. Who here has read about Chomsky's propaganda model? Okay. What is the most commonly, is the most common kind of phrase that comes up when people talk about propaganda model? Manufacturing of consent. Manufacturing of consent. Very true. Okay. Any other phrases or things around the propaganda model? Okay. Very often, people will refer to a book called Manufacturing Consent, because it was a book. Um, and uh, the authors are listed as Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. And usually, they just the books that they co-wrote go alphabetical, Ed, you know, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman. But this one was mainly written by Edward Herman, and uh, Chomsky asked for their names to be put the other way around because to reflect the contribution. Um, so I'm going to flash through the, the, the five filters as they're put out in that, in, in that book. So uh, in, in Manufacturing Consent, which was printed in the, published in the 80s, uh, Herman and Chomsky referred to one of the filters as anti-communism. Later on, Chomsky said he never felt totally comfortable with that because it was too specific. But it was basically about having a system, an ideology, where you have baddies and you have goodies. And that, you know, that filters, that shapes how you, you present stuff. Uh, another filter is the capital requirements of starting up in the mainstream media. Anyone got a guess about how much it costs to start a national newspaper? Millions. Huh? Millions. I don't know, millions, billions. <laughs> uh, uh, more money than we've got in this room, for sure. We're, we're not in a position to do that. So there's, there's an entry requirement to becoming a mass media entity. It's for rich people. So there's, there's something there. Um, there's a, this, lots of people wonder what this is. This is meant to be a podium with mics on it. Um, and what this symbolizes is the way that the mainstream media subsidizes, uh, is subsidized, sorry, by powerful institutions. So everyone's seen the White House reporters, you know, hall where they've got a hall, they've got all these facilities, they've got internet, they've got phones, they're going to, and um, 
the uh, powerful institutions not only put on physical environments and so on, they also supply news at the right time. You know, they have a large staff of people in a corporation, whatever, who are, who are supplying uh, news at the right deadlines and so on. Uh, who, you know, there's a constant supply of, of news coming in. There's lots of ways in which um, powerful institutions make it easier for uh, news institutions including, the easiest thing in the world is re to report a credible source. You just say, so-and-so of the Department of Transport, whatever, and you don't have to explain about where they got their degree or whatever. So even that, in a way, is a subsidizing thing about, about the credibility that you get from a powerful institution. This is a tin hat, uh, ARP, uh, for... Um, Harking back to the Second World War and people who were wandering around London and so on trying to help people in the Blitz and whatever. And this refers to one of the five forces, which is called FLAC. And FLAC refers to basically people attacking media institutions, which could be, we all, all of us in this room, we could all write a letter to the Times and say, why did you, you know, quote Diane Foley in that way? That's FLAC. But... Everyone at this conference writing a letter to the Times about that is going to have less impact than the head of Apple writing a letter. You know, it's like the more powerful you are, the more important, the more impact your the same action has. And obviously, the bigger you are, um, the more things you can do as well. Uh, the last of the filters I'm going to mention is what they call the advertising filter. So this is my drawing of the newspaper page and an advert on it uh, for a car. Um, a lot of folk may not know that the Guardian Media Group was kept going for a long time on the profits from Auto Trader magazine, um, basically advertising cars to sell, and you know that has been a crucial part of them keeping their nose above water. So um, what the advertising filter refers to is the fact that most of the income <coughs> of a newspaper comes from advertising. Anyone know any more on that score? Uh, it's at least 50%, 50 of, of, the, of the newspapers are advertising and about 80, 90%, I think, of the whole income of news companies is advertising. Of the what kind of? Uh, of new companies. Um, I am old enough to remember when the Observer was bought by the Guardian, and one of the indicators that it was basically non-viable was the fact that its share, the share of advertising income, in its total income, had gone down to 50%. So we think that we buy a newspaper to get the, to get information from it. Okay. Yeah. So we think. We buy the paper from the people who make the paper. But actually, if you look at it from a revenue point of view, what's happening is that advertisers pay the newspaper makers to create something that attracts a particular profile of people to get their attention. So we are actually the commodity. Our mind space is the commodity that's being <coughs> sold to the advertisers, if you look at it in revenue terms. Because we're, we're not coughing up even 50% of what it costs to do this stuff. Um, and, yeah, so there's a lot more to say about the advertising license, but those were the, those were the, the elements of the propaganda model that were put forward in the, uh, in the book, Manufacturing Consent. And that's very often what people think of when they refer to the propaganda model. And all of those are important parts of Chomsky's analysis of the mainstream media. Um, but he himself puts emphasis not on these kinds of factors. Uh, he tends not to do that. Um, one of the things that he emphasizes when he finds his bits of cardboard um, is, um, is about the spectrum of opinion in the mainstream media. So I've drawn this diagram here where I was trying to think of 
extremes. And so like the pyramid symbolizes centralized power. And service to power and the anarchy sign sim symbolizes like being totally anti-establishment. And so the self-image of the media is that they're anti-establishment, they're always criticizing, they're always attacking, they're, you know, um, they're on the side of the little people, and that's their, that's their self-image, and that's how they present themselves, especially the liberal, liberal media. Uh, but that's how journalists tend to see themselves. And what Chomsky, what Chomsky um, argues is that actually what happens in the mainstream media is more like service to power. And it's not that journalists set out to do that, or that that's their, um, that's their goal or how they see their job day to day, um, but that there is a, there's a culture that you sort of absorb like by osmosis. And if you don't absorb it by osmosis, then you, you tend to get the picture when you don't get promoted. So this, I'm just reproducing what Chomsky said. So let's say we're in newsroom, and the editor's over there of the newsroom, and we're all writing our stories. Some of them get picked up, some of them don't. Some of them get spiked. And from that, we learn how to get on. And so no one is necessarily sitting down and saying, OK, um, no, no, don't write about these topics. But there's a, a nose for news that we develop by what succeeds. And the person who's the editor in, in, on, you know, on the news desk or whatever, she's learned on the job and being promoted because she, can, she knows what's right. So when Chomsky talks about a guided free market and ideas, what he means is there's a free market anyone can buy and sell newspapers and ideas and whatever, but when you have these sharp inequalities and concentrations of wealth, then wealthy people buy the opinions of people who don't challenge too much the rights of wealthy people. So you would just expect that if there are incredible concentrations of, of wealth um, in society and mainstream mass media organizations are basically owned by rich people because they're the only ones who can afford to set them up and their main business is selling audiences to other corporations who are placing the advertising, you would expect that to create a culture within media institutions um, that is not too challenging. So those are expectations. That's not proof. For, for proof of this stuff, you have to actually find examples and show um, how information has not been reported correctly or whatever. Um, one of the things that Chomsky's done is he's done a thing where he's taken a hot topic and he's taken a certain period of time in which what it was highly debated and so on, and gone through and seen what views were expressed in the opinion pieces during that time on that topic. And what he's found over and over is that there's this incredible self-discipline within the free media. It's not that there's someone in government saying, don't publish these voices or whatever. It's something that people um, are um, internalizing. They're absorbing and internalizing so that they make the right choices. <coughs> and you get this phenomenal uniformity. So you'll get a guard, you'll get a columnist in the Guardian or wherever who says, no one tells me what to write. And that's absolutely true. I'm sure 98% of the time, that's absolutely true. <coughs> but how did they get to be a columnist? How did they get chosen to be in that position? because they were a safe pair of hands, because there would be no need to <coughs> tell them what to do. Now, there are examples of uh, people pushing the boundaries of what you can do within the mainstream media. And Chomsky's pointed to a bunch of people who, who've, uh, who've done that and who he thinks are, are very important. <coughs> and he says there's a lot further that we could push the mainstream media than, they are, than where they are right now. There's a lot more that we could... We could, um, we could get them to do in terms of reporting fairly stuff that's going on. 
but the big problem um, he would point to is not in the right-wing media, <coughs> but more in the liberal media, people who think of themselves as the anti-establishment uh, folk, um, and who they present themselves and they see themselves as basically attacking the system, but actually they're reinforcing the system. And he has a phrase for that, which uh, I've written out, feigned dissent. Um, so, for example, where he started off talking about this was during the Vietnam War, um, when there was, there was an anti-war view within the mainstream media, which was um, represented by people like Anti Noon Lewis, um, who were against the war. And they said, we should not be at war in Vietnam. And um, there were right-wing hawks who were saying, you know, we should be bombing them back to the Stone Age. And what Chomsky said was, what wasn't really noticed in the mainstream debate was that the people in the mainstream who were against the war were against the war on the grounds either that it was costing us too much, by us I mean the US, costing the US too much, or that it was costing the Vietnamese too much. It was, it was a bit too bloody for them. And uh, so what that meant was that the liberal critics would have been in favor of the war if it could have been won at less cost to the US and killing slightly fewer people, I mean, I shouldn't use the word slightly, killing fewer people in Vietnam. And he said, what you don't get in the mainstream media, and this is one of those examples of the spectrum of thinkable thought, you know, where he, he goes through a whole lot of opinion pieces and try to see what, what crops up. So there was, the, the view was not represented in the mainstream US media, which was <coughs> conservative Asian view of the thing, which was that the US <coughs> had no right unilaterally to determine by force the political order in another country. Now, that w in, in India, that was like a, that was a moderately right, you know, moderately right wing people would say, actually, the US doesn't have a right to be doing this. But in, in the US, <coughs> that view didn't crop up. The anti war view was, it's costing too much or we're not going to win, and um, we're hurting them too much. There was no principled opposition to the war. So um, those, are, those are some aspects of the, um, of the uh, propaganda model. I'm now going to invite you to to turn to someone else to pair up and just talk about what's happened so far with the newspaper thing and <coughs> the lecture bit. So I'm going to invite you to talk, about, talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes. <coughs>
Okay. I, I, if you'd like to put your hand up if you've got a question, I'm going to see how many people there are. Okay, I'm going to go with the first hand, which is the back. Okay, so I was really, uh, uh, really interested, obviously, uh, in, in the concept of the advertising filter, where, because that was... Because I often think about this in the terms of, uh, of, of uh, centralised social media, social networking platforms, okay, where they're, they're a great point of uh, production, but a great point of production must be produced content from them. Okay, but uh, advertising is delivered via those social media networks. I've not really considered that in the, in, in the printed press, but, so my question is, are there any analyses, Chomsky analyses of contemporary social media platforms that you can direct us to Um I'm not aware of anyone who's done a detailed analysis of social, uh, you know, social media ads in terms of this framework. Um, what was most on your mind in asking that question? Well, I, I really, well, I've not considered, I've not considered that the uh, printed press had been just there to the adverts, where I thought Facebook was for us. It yeah. was there to just farm the people it. So, uh, so I, I Facebook is there to gather advertising data on all its users yes. in order to commoditize us to advertisers accurately, yes. precisely. Yes. Okay. So, so it's an even more extreme example yeah, where yes. they don't produce any content. We produce the content yeah. to attract ourselves yeah, and give all of our advertising Probably. data to them Probably. to advertise to us. My question really was, you know, which was, is how can you apply this kind of Chomsky analysis to more contemporary forms of media? Well, I think I just did, I mean, because, and it doesn't require a lot of modification. I think I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Oh, at the back, yeah, yeah. Oh, did you stick your hand up? Yeah. yeah yes, it. good. Um, okay. Yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, that's all useful, but is there any hope for disseminating the information in a more um, balanced way? Because I've got an opinion, so if, if I choose to put um, a view of, from a family or a victim which is more sympathetic for my first paragraph, then I've just asserted that, like, you know, she's saying, on the, on the, the woman who says that we want him shot from the eyes is saying a controversial view, but the reason it's interesting is because the newspapers think that people are going to latch onto it and because maybe it's saying something, something negative, depending on what, where you stand um, about contemporary feelings or views or, do you see what I mean, a kind of trend in thought. So, do you see what I mean? Like, if I, if I do it the other way around, it's still, and it's still my opinion, it's still unbalanced. How do you... How do you do your objective? Yeah, I mean, it's not... Like, is there any kind of answer? Okay, well, I'll try to say what Chomsky says about objectivity, which is that um, objective... So there is a view that there's no such thing as objectivity, you can't be objective and so on. And what Chomsky says is that objectivity in journalism or history or whatever, you know, uh, in the soft sciences or however you want to call it, Objectivity is basically the same thing as in the hard sciences, which is you've got evidence in front of you and you treat it fairly and you use logic. And it, sometimes you don't have, you personally as a journalist, don't have all of the evidence that's available kind of to the public, but at a moment in time you've got a certain amount of evidence in front of you and you treat it fairly and that's objectivity. Now, in this case, um, in the case of you know, the, the victims' families, um, what I, I totally get what you're saying, that the bullet in the head is, the, is, is a very striking thing to say and so on. Um, what my point was not so much about the bullet in the head, but about the report, the, the way that the forgiveness thing, which is equally striking and strange, Oh, well, it's not, uh, it's not strange, but it's equally striking and newsworthy. It's basically suppressed, even by the Times, which reports it. It's effectively suppressed. So 
Um, I wasn't arguing with the reporter or even leading with the, the bullet in the head quote, but just pointing to a way in which information, you can say it did appear in the media, but you could also say it was effectively suppressed. And, you know, pretty much nobody's ever going to remember that that woman said that thing. So uh, there, I think there could be fair ways. Oh, we're supposed to finish at 10 too. Oh, rats, I was working to the hour. Okay, we're, we're totally messed. We're totally messed up. Sorry. We're totally messed up. Okay, we're going to draw it to a close. <laughs> <laughs>